the relationship between John Gotti and Joe the German Watts, plus much more. Joe the German Watts would not only play a pivotal role in John Gotti's rise to power in the Gambinos, but was also known to have been putting in work for the family dating back to Carlo Gambino's reign as boss in the 1970s. Joe Watts would serve as a useful tool for three different bosses, including Paul Castellano, who he would later help take out on that fateful December night outside of Spark Steakhouse, which would bump John Gotti up to boss of the Gambinos. John Gotti and the German were said to have been close friends, and it's even been rumored that Gotti unofficially appointed Watts as a captain, even though Watts wasn't supposed to be made due to his half Italian and half German heritage. Even if this rumor wasn't true, according to numerous mobsters, Watts received the respect of a captain regardless because of the way he carried himself as both a gentleman and a gangster. Watts is said to have been responsible for up to 30 murders during his time with the Gambinos, and according to different sources, there's a strong possibility Watts and Gotti personally did a hit together on behalf of Paul Castellano, who ordered the murder of his own daughter's boyfriend, Vito Borelli, for comparing Castellano to the owner of Purdue Chicken, to which Big Paul responded by giving Gotti the order. According to Bonanno underboss turned government witness Sal Vitali, both the Gambinos and Bananos would work together to pull the hit off. At the time, the Bonanno family was seeking allies after losing their spot on the commission, which would last until 1984, banning them from inducting any new members. So upon hearing about the Gambinos' problem, acting boss Salvatore Catalano offered their help. Borelli in the past had been put on record with the Bonanos by then imprisoned boss Philip Rastelli and had dated his niece, so they would use that to their advantage. Two Bonanno captains, Joe Messino and Dominic Napolitano, were summoned to assist. From there, they would have Bonanno soldier Anthony Rabito lure Borelli to his cookie shop warehouse at 308 East 53rd Street in Midtown Manhattan, where he would be met by John Gotti and Joe Watts and would be shot to death. At the time, Gotti was acting captain of the Gambinos and Watts was an associate. The two Bonanno captains waited outside as lookouts. Along with Gotti and Watts and Messino and Napolitano, there were other members present for both families. Present for the Gambinos was Angelo Ruggiero, Frank DeChico, and John Carneglia. Present with the Bonanos was said to be James Episcopia, Anthony Rabito, and John Sarasani. It said that earlier that same day, Messino associate Dwayne Goldie Leisenheimer had stolen a panel truck, which he would deliver to Bonanno associate Salvatore Vitali and Gambino soldier John Carneglia, which they parked outside of Rabito's cookie shop warehouse so they could later transfer the body. But later that night, Vitali would get a call from Messino stating that the truck wasn't starting. So Vitali would drive back to Manhattan. And after he tried starting the truck without any luck, he would volunteer his own car to complete the mission. Vitali, along with the Gambino soldier Frank DeChico, would place the body in the trunk where they were said to have delivered it to another crew already waiting in or near the south side of Ozone Park. Heading up the crew was none other than the infamous Gambino soldier and psychopath Roy DeMeo, aka The Butcher, who would then dismember the body and ship it off to the Fountain Avenue dump, business as usual. Vitali had originally stated this hit had taken place in the mid-1970s, but Vitali was known for mixing up dates. But Joe Messino, who would later become boss of the Bananos and then turn government witness, would clarify he was captain at the time. So in comparing Messino's testimony with other sources, it appears this hit took place in the fall of 1980. And also in 1983, 20 years prior to Vitali's testimony, Gambino associate, a member of the DeMeo crew, Frederick DeNome, became a cooperating witness and gave a vague statement in regards to this hit while filling in the feds on a number of murders committed by Roy DeMeo, in which he described the victim as an unidentified car dealer in Manhattan at a cookie factory, whose body he claimed was transported to Brooklyn from Manhattan, where it was disposed of. But DeNome, 
who was hesitant from the jump with implicating himself in murders, had been omitting certain details to federal agents and may have been present with DeMeo at the time and possibly even participated in the dismemberment. He may have just been trying to throw authorities off. The gnome would commit suicide in 1986, not too long after his first appearance to testify in court. Going over Messino's accounts of what took place, it appears he may have just spun the story to fit a narrative to suit himself or to protect certain other men who were there. Now let's fast forward about seven years later to April 29, 1987, to another story involving both Gotti and the German. At this point, Gotti had been voted in as Gambino family boss following the big Paul hit to which Watts was later named as being one of the backup shooters outside of Sparks Steakhouse in case anything went wrong. John Gotti just stepped out of his social club when him and his crew heard what sounded like one gunshot and his crew began pursuing the man who was believed to be the shooter. According to eyewitnesses, seven men started chasing William Chacon, eventually shooting him one time in his butt. The man was then dragged into a black Mercedes Benz, which was said to be owned by either John Gotti or Joe Watts, and was driven to Paul's Sweet Shop, located at 44 Dort Place on Staten Island, which was owned by a longtime fellow Gambino member, Joe the Cat LaFour, where he was taken to the basement where Gotti then allegedly called Watts and told him to interrogate the man. It said Watts then tortured the man for several hours while the man endlessly rambled Bible verses. Watts would then call Gotti and tell him the guy was a religious nut, to which Gotti allegedly replied by telling Watts to kill him. Early 4.30 the next morning on April 30th, 1987, Police responded to a possible break-in at Paul's sweet shop because of broken hinges on the door. Upon entering, police discovered Chacon's body badly beaten and shot at least four times in the face and then stuffed into a mortician's bag. If those stories alone didn't give you an understanding of the violence Joe Watts, aka the German, was capable of, According to other sources online, Watts had up to 30 murders under his belt and was said to dismember his victims with a chainsaw and sometimes would put their bodies in hydrochloric acid. On top of being a deadly and cutthroat enforcer, the German was also described as one of the classiest guys Cosa Nostra had ever seen and was said to be as charismatic as John Gotti and shared the same fashion sense as the Dapper Don, having great taste in wearing designer suits. Following the DeMeo hit, John Gotti would appoint Watts as head liaison between the Westies and the Gambino family. Throughout the years, the Westies are said to have killed up to a thousand different people on behalf of the Gambino family, which came to an end following the conviction of Westies boss Jimmy Coonan on charges including 23 counts of murder, plus several counts of bombing, kidnapping, arson, extortion, witness intimidation, and juror intimidation after his former partner Mickey Featherstone turned government informant after being framed for a murder by his old boss Jimmy Coonan. Another infamous incident regarding the Dapper Don and the German is the time Gotti had Watts tell Frank Sinatra if he ever stood up John Gotti again, Watts' face would be the last face he ever seen after Sinatra had invited Gotti to a show at Carnegie Hall with the promise of having a VIP dinner backstage. Sinatra canceled the show claiming health issues, but that same night when Gotti and his crew were out to eat at the Savoy Grill, Sinatra unknowingly came walking through the door laughing and smiling. Also after the hit on Big Paul and Thomas Bellotti, Gotti gave Watts Bellotti's loan sharking operation, which Watts was said to have made 30,000 a week from. Watts bought a compound in Sarasota, Florida, which was dubbed a fortress and included two houses, a tennis court, and a bunch of Dobermans and a 10-foot concrete wall as a security system. On top of being an enforcer, Watts specialized in construction company scams and labor racketeering. The German was so respected that boss at the time, Paul Castellano, once ordered a hit on a man just for disrespecting Watts in a bar in Staten Island although the hit was never completed. Also, according to Sammy LeBull Gravano, Watts shot and stabbed Augustus Scalfani to death in Little Italy in a club on orders from John Gotti. In 2011, 
Watts pled guilty to 13 years for a murder committed by the DeCavacante family and was granted immunity in exchange for admitting to a 1990 murder that was allegedly committed by Vinnie Ocean Palermo, who turned government witness and went into witness protection, but is now running strip clubs as a free man. Joe the German Watts is now a free man after being released from FCI Cumberland in January 14, 2022. All of his information is public knowledge provided by sources available to you online. If you enjoyed this video, please smash the like and subscribe button and hit the bell for all notifications on new videos. For exclusive content, join the Wise Guy family by clicking the join button on the Wise Guy TV homepage. Thank you for watching, and until next time, it's Wise Guy TV.